And what is this doubly robust stuff? The work on diff and diff, the work on diff and diff went in uh, two directions. Okay. You had um, the matching. Hold on. You had the IPW and you had the outcome regression. Actually, let me back up here. So we had here outcome regression. And this was Heckman et al. 1997 restudy, Review of Economic Studies. Okay? And it comes up with a diff and diff estimator that handles covariates. All right? Handles covariates, not a two way fixed effects estimator. It's not going to include time varying. So it's going to have time invariant covariates, not a two-way fixed estimator with conditional parallel trends. Okay. And we'll put here two-way fixed effects. Two-way fixed effects had time varying controls had time varying controls but this one had non varying controls it just used two way fixed effects it was a multivariate regression and it just put a bunch of stuff on the right hand side and then the inverse probability weighting that's a body a 2005 and it handles time invariant controls to satisfy conditional parallel trends, all right? Now, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Well, this one is coming from the matching. Let me redo that. This one is coming from the matching literature. So there's the matching literature and there's the diff and diff literature. And inside the matching literature, there was this effort to basically combine both of them in a single estimator called the doubly robust estimator. And the doubly robust estimator, all that it did was it just took both the outcome regression approach and it took the inverse probability weighting approach and just combined them, all right? It just combined them. Well, Abadie took the matching literature, which had IPW, which is in my book, created a diff and diff estimator, all right? And then some people like Hirano and Imbens, they took that, they took this matching literature and they created doubly robust. So this right here should be, this right here should be this. So they created doubly robust that combined outcome regression and matching, all right? And so what Santana and Zhao do What Santana and Zhao do is they create a doubly robust version of DD that combined IPW and outcome regression, just like Hirano and Imbens had done in matching. Hirano and Imbens had done it in matching, Pedro's gonna do it in diff and diff. 
okay? So, so DR, doubly robust, is a class of estimators that combine a regression specification for the outcome and combine a propensity score specification. And why you do that is because you need to satisfy conditional parallel trends. You need to satisfy conditional parallel trends and, um, and then, uh, but you can't, you don't want to use two way fixed effects. And so you're going to use this one, but what you're going to do when you use this one is you're not going to, uh, have to make a choice between Heckman and Abadier. You're going to do both. And it's going to work so long as one of those models is correct. You don't need both of them to be correct. So if you were using inverse probability weighting for a body A, which is a propensity score based estimator, you need that propensity score to be correctly specified, right? If you're using Heckman outcome regression approaches, you need that outcome regression to be correctly specified. No way getting around it. You got to have both correctly specified. Doubly robust is going to say you only have to get one right. And if you get one right, you're good. All right. So what it's going to do is it's going to control for X twice, once with linear regression, once with propensity score, hoping that at least one of them is right. And we're going to look at how it's done. And then we're going to look and see how it compares with two way fixed effects. Now, the reason to learn this paper is because it's the engine of the Callaway and Santana estimator, which is probably the more truly valuable estimator. Although when I have studied Santana and Zhao, to be completely honest with you, I think it is one of the most important papers I've read in a long time. So it's the, but it is the engine of the Callaway and Santana estimator. It's a dense paper, a lot of hairy notation. I'm going to do my best. So the thing about Pedro that I've noticed is he's really good at bridging gaps in a literature, taking two things and kind of bringing them together in a valid way. And that's what he's going to do here. He's going to take this doubly robust class of estimators, extend it over to diff and diff with all of its unique properties. All right. So let's look at, and there's new work on machine learning that'll do it too. So let's look at this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the basic assumptions for diff and diff with covariates. We're going to look at the two way fixed effects assumptions for diff and diff with covariates. We're going to look at the estimation alternatives to two way fixed effects with covariates. And there is a fourth part of the paper called the, uh, that has to do with standard errors. And what they're going to do is he derives these things called semi parametric bounds. And I'm not going to discuss that. Um, but that's also in the paper. So we've covered covariates already with a body A, right? We did that. That was this, the Abadie estimator, the one y'all just did for the replication. That, that we did. So why are we discussing DID? Why are we discussing doubly robust if we've already done it? Because Abadie 05 assumes that you have correctly specified the propensity score. All right? It, it, it assumes that you've correctly specified the uh, propensity score. But what if you haven't? Well, what if you could combine another method that also controls for X, but that by including it, you kind of simultaneously control for X two different ways and you only need to get one of them right. It's like having two strikes instead of one. Now let's look back at what this is. Now this Santana and Zhao paper is not a staggered rollout paper. It is a um, simple two by two paper. So DD is going to always estimate the average treatment on the treated because it's the only treatment effect for the treatment group in the post treatment period. It is not the average treatment effect. It is not the local average treatment effect. It is the average treatment on the treated for a particular point in time. Notice this is the ATT at different points in time. 
notice how there is a subscript T in the first two terms. And it's 4D equal 1, so it's an ATT. D equal 1 is the treatment group, so this is the average treatment effect for the treated. Okay. So what are the assumptions of diff and diff? What is it that makes it diff and diff? There's really just a couple of assumptions that make something a diff and diff model. First is you need panel data or repeated cross sections. Panel data would follow the same uh, groups over time, that same units over time. That would be like for the loaned uh, national uh, the NSW, the, the job trainings program, I just all of a sudden forgot the name of it, NSW, the, the, the work program that you just did, that, that's a panel. It's following the same people over time, all right? A repeated cross-section would be like a sample of people in the pre-treatment period, a sample of different people in the post-treatment period, all right? But from the same general area, all right? Now, Pedro derives everything for both panel and repeated cross-section, but the notation for the repeated cross-section is, is quite challenging to work with, so I've chosen to only focus on the panel data for this talk. It's just that the results are going to be similar for repeated cross-sections. And then the other basic assumption is the parallel, the, the parallel trends assumption. Now, so often in a diff and diff, you will put in controls. If you were running two-way fixed effects and you were putting in time varying controls, you were explicitly assuming conditional parallel trends. That's what you were assuming, right? So if you were putting covariates into your DD regression, then you were assuming parallel trends held for males. They held for females, but maybe not for both. Right? Depending upon the composition of males and females, you may not be able to get that. But you get it within covariance. Right? So that's conditional parallel trends. Now, the third assumption, which is not often talked about, but we did talk about it with the body A, is it just means that for some of the for these values of X, for men, there's got to be treatment, there's got to be groups in the treatment group and the groups in the control. There's got to be some. For some epsilon greater than zero. The probability of being in the treatment group just has to be greater than zero. How does it become greater than zero? If there is four males, if there are a hundred males, at least one of them has to be in one of the groups. Okay? So if there's 99 in the treatment group, there's got to be at least one in the control group. All right? That's what it means to have some E greater than zero probability of being in the treatment group. It's a frequentist idea. It's just taking the number of people in the group divided by the total. And if that is equal to a one, if there are a hundred people in the treatment group out of a hundred males, hundred males in the treatment group out of a hundred males, then E is not greater than zero because E is not greater than zero for the control group, right? There's nobody in the control group. So it's called overlap or common support. It means there's at least a small fraction of the population that is treated and that for every value of the covariate, there is at least a small chance that the unit is not treated. Small chance meaning just a pure frequentist idea. It's a prior, right? It's just about the treatment in the control group across values of X. All right, so estimating DD with assumptions one to three. Assumptions one to three gives us a couple of options for estimating the difference in differences, we can either use outcome regression, OR, that's the Heckman et al. paper, or we can use the propensity score approach of Avadia. That's the propensity score approach, the IPW. We could also use a third approach, which is two-way fixed effects, and just control for covariates. But what I'm gonna show you is, if you use two-way fixed effects, those three assumptions are not enough. You actually need three more. And I really want to hammer this on you because this is not something that is typically taught in econometrics because 
this is new this is new theory so here's the heckman model all right here's the heckman model it's an approach where the outcome evolution is modeled with a regression so here's the sample average for the treatment group in the post period so it's group one in the post period minus the sample average of the treatment group in the pre-period so this is group one post group one pre All right and it's a minus notice it's a minus okay it's a minus what is this this is outcome regression diff and diff for the control group. Notice a couple of things here. Notice notice the zero. Okay? What does that mean? Whatever mu hat means, it's only for the control group all right it's only for the control group so that's the first thing and then this appears to be pre to post so this is control mu hat post minus control mu hat pre Control mu hat post minus control mu hat pre. But look at what mu is based on. Mu hat is fitted. That's what the hat means. Two based on values uh, of x. Xi. It's based on values of xi. So it's something, it's something about xi for an individual unit that is being projected through some sort of fitting process as a new number okay but it's an outcome okay so here's what it is mu hat is y hat it's the predicted outcome for the control group given its value of x its time invariant x okay so it's y hat it's an outcome regression y hat and y hat comes from a regression it's the second step in a regression process in regression in a regression process estimate a regression to get fitted values estimate a regression for control only get fitted values of y for each unit based on her x values Okay, that's what it is. It's just going to do it in the post and the pre. All right, so this is the Abadie estimator. You should know this one because you just did a uh, you just did a um, um, replication doing it. All right, so you get this inverse probability weighting or this outcome regression. Outcome regression. Here's a diff and diff expression for it. Inverse probability weighting, here's a diff and diff regression for it. All right. So all that this is is a diff and diff. This is here's the treatment group diff, here's the control group diff. It's just an adjusted control group diff. It's an adjusted control group diff. You're going to average over all of these and get its own delta, its own delta here, and this will be. 
delta mu hat x i zero. That's what it's going to be. And this will be the this will be the difference before and after for the control. And this right here is the difference before and after for the treatment. Okay? And this is just a different way to do the same thing. All right? Now, both of these assume that you fit that regression model correctly. Because remember what the first step was, the first stage? The first step was run a regression. Run a regression. Pray to God it's the right regression. Pray to God you put those X's, the right X's in there, and in the right way. You put in the right polynomials. Same thing here. These P hats were based on some semi-parametric, semi-parametric um, propensity score. So outcome regression needs to be correctly specified if you're going to use the outcome regression approach of Heckman et al. Inverse probability weighting needs to be correctly specified if you're going to use the inverse probability weighting method of Ebody A2005. And it's hard to rank them. You can't really say which one's better because each is inconsistent when their own models are misspecified. They just are different methods. So why don't we use two-way fixed effects, right? Why don't we use two-way fixed effects? I've been using it my whole life. I've been using it since 03. Went into grad school, 02, never ran a regression before 03. Um, why don't I just use it? Well, it depends on whether you want to assume more three more, three more things. And, and when I wrote the mixtape, I didn't know this because this Santana and Zal paper just came out. So here's the two-way fixed effect specification without covariates. And this, this specification under parallel trends, delta identifies the ATT. But this one, even under parallel trends, including time varying controls, won't identify the ATT even under, sorry, Conditional parallel trends won't identify the ADD without three more assumptions. This one only needed parallel trends. This one needs more assumptions. Right? And what are they? So two-way fixed effects is going to place restrictions on the data generating process. Right? So let's look at... Um, the previous two-way fixed effects regression. You're going to have, where was it? Here. Alpha 1, a constant. Alpha 2, a time post dummy. Alpha 3, a treatment dummy. And delta is a, uh, sorry, this will be this one right here. Delta is TD, right? Plus that omega X, right? So we're doing this here. We got for the treatment group, one, 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 right? In the post period, right? Alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three plus delta plus lambda x, theta x. Conditional parallel trends implies that expectation y one minus y zero for the treatment group conditional on x is equal to expectation y zero in the post minus expectation y zero in the pre for the control group conditional on x. And we can just solve for we can just solve for, um, you know, expectation Y zero in, for the treatment group in the post period. And under parallel trends, it's just equal to the sum of these three terms. That's what it, conditional parallel trends implies. Now, you can't just add these three together and think that you got this because this only equals this under parallel trends. All right. So this right here. This right here is the regression outcome for the treatment group. Oops. For the treatment group 
in the post period. That's why that's a one. That's why that exists. And this is the post treatment. This is the post treatment. Uh, y zero for d equal one. So post period in a world where it's not treated. Well, for the post treated in a world where it's not treated, all right, you've got alpha one, post alpha two, treatment group alpha three, but there is no treatment. So um, there is no delta, but you still have the lambda x. Okay, so this one right here, counterfactual. This one is real. But the difference, the difference between them is the ATT. Okay, the ATT, remember, is just, the ATT is just expectation Y1 in the post for d equal one x minus expectation y zero in the post for the treatment group x. That's the ATT. So it's gonna be this whole thing minus this whole thing, All right? And some of this stuff's gonna cancel out. And then we're gonna be left with this plus lambda x minus this. And we wanna know when can we cancel this out and when can we not cancel it out? All right, so let's fill these things in. All right, here it is right here. Let's allow, let's allow X, all right? Let's allow X to have different effects under two states of the world. One world where it's treated, one world where it's not, okay? By allowing the possibility that under treatment, X has its own effect on Y that is different in a world where it's not treated is another way of assuming that the treatment effects, that the treatment effects don't depend upon X, okay? That the, the actual tri parallel trends depends on X, but we have to now assume that the treatment effect doesn't depend on X. Okay, it's an additional assumption and it's slightly different from conditional parallel trends. So the implications of that previous two-way fixed effects regression is that it's also assuming that these two things here are equal to each other. Okay, so when the treatment exists, this is theta x. And when the treatment doesn't exist, this is theta x. And we just need that to be that the treatment itself has nothing to do with these X's. And if it does have something to do with these X's, then these thetas will not be equal to each other. That's called homogeneous treatment effects in X. Now, there's other things we also need. To illustrate that, let's look at this. Let's calculate expectation Y1 for the treatment group. Expectation Y0 for the treatment. Expectation Y1 for the Control, expectation Y0 for the control. What are these? This is the post, pre, post, pre. All right? Post, pre, that's the Y1. That's the Y1 here. Post, 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 post. And then we've got uh, the pre, zero, pre, zero, pre. All right, so that's what those numbers mean. Now, all we're going to do is we're just going to plug in whether it's post or pre. So when it's post for the treatment group, all the alphas show up because remember what the alphas are. Here's the alphas. Alpha post treatment group one times one is delta all right so expectation y1 for the treatment group is going to be equal to and that should be comma x 
alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 plus delta plus lambda x11. So this is a time varying covariate. And since it's a time varying covariate, since it is a time varying covariate, x takes on a new value in the post period than it did in the pre period for that treatment group. All right? So it's x11 here, it's x10 here, it's x01 here, it's x00 here. All right? We're just allowing it to be exactly right. So when it's expectation y0, that's the pre for the treatment group, we lose alpha 2. Because remember, alpha 2 was post. So if it's the pre, we don't have a post. Same thing. Alpha 1 plus alpha 2 for the control group. In the post period, we lose alpha 3. We also lose delta. And for the control group in the pre, we lose alpha 2 and alpha 3 and delta. And we get this lambda x0, 0. Now we're going to go through and do our diff and diff. Now remember what our diff and diff is. Our diff and diff is expectation y1 d equal 1 x minus expectation y0 d equal 1 x minus expectation y1 d equal 0 x minus expectation y0 d equal 0 x like this. Okay? That is our DD. That's our DD estimate. Right? That's our DD estimate. Okay? But we're going to plug in the values for each of these. Expectation Y1 It's right here. So we're going to plug that in minus this one, minus this one, minus this one. Now some terms are going to cancel out. Look what cancels out. Alpha 1 cancels out. Alpha 3 cancels out. Alpha 1 cancels out. Alpha 1 cancels out. Alpha 2 cancels out. And so what we're left with is this plus this minus this minus this minus this. So look what that is. Eliminating the terms, we get the causal effect plus, look at what this is. This is x over time. x over time must have the same trends for the treatment group as it did for the control group. You need parallel x trends for every x in your two-way fixed effects regression. Parallel x trends. And if you do not have parallel x trends for every x in your regression, they will not cancel out and you need them to cancel out. But if you have parallel trends, fine. Okay? Now this was not needed. These new three assumptions were not needed for either OR or IPW. But now you need six assumptions for a two-way fixed effects estimate of a DD design. Otherwise, it will be biased of unknown magnitude and sign. You'll be off. You may have the sign flip again. So he calls this no X specific trends in both groups. All right. Without these six in general, two way fixed effects will not identify ATT. Unclear how bad it'll be, but it will be biased. So let's review the problem. What if you claim you need X for conditional parallel trends? Can use outcome regression, assumptions one to three, properly specified the outcome regression. You could use inverse probability weighting, properly specified the inverse probability weighting, and you could use two way fixed effects. It needs uh, who does that? Basically, everybody. 
Um, nobody even cite. Nobody even you know. I'm everybody yet uses it. It needs six assumptions, right? But the problem is, one and two have their own individual assumptions, which is the models need to be correctly specified. You can't have misspecification in the outcome regression or the inverse probability way. So what you're going to do is you're going to use double robust, and now you only have to get it right one time. You could get it right both times, but you need to only get it right one time. And then what Pedro is going to do, Pedro and Bean, what they're going to do is they're going to run a bunch of Monte Carlos for all three of these, as well as double robust, and show how each of them perform under different situations. All right. So the next step that we've got to cover is we've uh, we, we looked at our you know our three prior covariate DD models. We looked at their assumptions. We've got these hints about outcome regression in IPW. Let's move into the estimation phase. Let's see what doubly robust estimators look like. And as before, I'm only going to stick to the panel data expressions because all repeated cross-section does is add some more terms. All right? So what I'll do is I'll finish filming this. I'll upload it to uh, Dropbox. I'll give that over to... Um, near all right i'll see you guys again in person next monday um but wednesday just look for the next video to drop okay so i gave you guys a week extension on the replication and um i will see you in a couple of days does anybody have any questions here i'm gonna turn off the recording